Hello and welcome to Geo Up, Over and Down Under. I'm Joy. And I'm Rose and today we'll be speaking with Jeffrey Weverson. Jeff Weverson is a native of North Carolina and was based in Colorado for several years before coming down under in 2000 where he's continued his full spectrum creativity approach to being here now. His ongoing educational background is in multidisciplinary science, including independent research in the psychology of mass media and communication with dolphins. He works equally in words and visuals and music and has been a still photographer for over 40 years. He and his partner, Lisbeth, have been travelling around Australia and New Zealand primarily by hitchhiking for over four years given away thousands of painted rocks and have made four films so far. Their latest Beyond film is about who the whales and dolphins are as fellow beings. Jeff spent a lot of time and energy as an information activist, networking with friends around the world in an attempt to inspire high-quality, reality-based awareness that leads to real changes in our mentality and lifestyles. He works full-time for Mother Nature and his motto of the 21st century is... Talk is for dictators. Act now to create the world you love. Jeff, welcome. You're welcome to the show, Jeff. Aroha Nui from Aotearoa. <laughs> nice to have you here, my friend. Thank you so much for making all this possible. So we're going to kick this off with it has recently been suggested to, to our team that we do a children's talk show about nature, music, some art, um, that type of thing. But you and your partner, Elizabeth, have, de- have devoted your lives to this type of awareness. Let's talk some music and art and travel at this point. And if you could, name your four, f- four films that you've done also. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, Elizabeth's actually got a degree in video editing from college. I've been shooting video footage for many years, but had never really done that much with it. And so together we make a, a really awesome creative team. The four films we've made so far... Um, the first one is called cryo now. Cryo is an it's also it's it's a word that means extremely cool, you know, like cryogenics. But it also stands for creating reality of your own. So cryo 2008 is the highlights of our adventures hitchhiking around Australia and New Zealand in 2008. And it's a film we'd like to do a film like that of each year, but we're we're a little behind. Our second film is called the Chronicles of Balarnia. Balarnia being, Balarney being the nickname of our friend Arnie who lives on uh, an island off of Tasmania where he lets us come and live at his remote property for a few months at a time next to the sea with no electricity. So this film is uh, about the six weeks that we spent there in 2009. Our third film is called Tawaiwaia Dreaming. Tawaiwaia is ancient Waitaha or Maori means the realm of the beautiful waters. And this is a short film consisting of footage of water flowing in different forms shot in the Northern Territory of Australia with original music that I did primarily on grand piano. And our fourth film is actually a, an extended digital slideshow of over a thousand still photographs of Great Barrier Island, another place that we're lucky to be able to spend a lot of time. And this one does not have original music that I did like the other three films. Uh, I didn't have time to record any new stuff there. So we used music that we like, a lot of it by Native American flute players and kind of uh, ambient music like that. So that this is something, we really just give our films away, don't, we don't sell them anyway, but I'd like to redo the soundtrack to the slideshow with our own music. We've got several more film projects lined up. One we're going to start on that we're actually getting footage together for now is Beyond Film, about who the whales and dolphins are as fellow beings. Not a National Geographic kind of thing about these beautiful creatures, but an attempt to actually go into their minds and try to explore who they are. So it's not going to be about looking at them, but it's going to be about using our highest creative abilities with audio and visual to create a portal into the cetacean consciousness. Wow, let's talk some art and music. I've been on your site and I've seen some of your artwork and it is absolutely amazing. Maybe if you could expand on that and, and tell us what we're looking at when we're looking at these things. Well, you're looking at the... the neurobiological structure of your own brain. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, but I, I think our, <laughs> art, our art is is really inspired by the earth and mother nature and the, the beauty of the cosmos. Our art is not about creating a pretty picture to go on the wall, which is kind of the sort of ornamental tradition of, of a lot of Western mainstream art. 
our art is also not representational. We don't try to paint pictures of things as you'd actually see them. Um, it's because we do, I mean, you know, we do like non-representational versions of sea life. You know, you can tell it's a dolphin, but it's, it's not a photographic oppression. So what we try to do is be very creative. You use lots of color. We try to put a whole rainbow in every painting if we can, or, or also uh, between the two of us, we've probably painted over 40,000 individual rocks. So our, our inspiration is closer to the reason that indigenous cultures have always done art, which is a part of their spiritual process, their spiritual cosmology, the, the mandalas of the ancient Hindus or the sand paintings of the Navajo or the, the bark paintings in, of the aboriginal people. And Jose Arguez, who is someone that I have a lot of respect for his early work as an artist and a visionary researcher, he came up with the concept of uh, art as internal technology. If you're looking at it that way, when you look at a piece of art, you can think of it as a type of software. When you're looking at, at that entire image, because of the, the simultaneous nature of our visual processing, you're able to sort of see the entire image all at once. Whereas with a linear process like reading, you're sort of scanning in a word or a group of words at a time, but with a visual image, you're using a more holistic perceptual mode that enables the, the entire image to be perceived all at once. So just looking at a visual image changes the way that you think, and then the different information contained in the color, the geometry, and the relationships and stuff. A lot of different effects that can be going on. We see art as a kind of a form of information transfer, possibly even a language that the earth uses to communicate with people. I think when I look at a lot of Aboriginal painting, it looks like the painting's almost talking to you. You know, like it's alive. It's a form of, of information exchange between mm. the consciousness of the earth and, and, and uh, people who are, people that is, who are, their mentality enables them to perceive this information. Now, is that the same concept that you're using with the rocks that you give away? So I'm sitting here on my screen looking at these, and we will pop the link up in chat for people to check them out themselves. But, again, some amazing, beautiful artwork. And, and what is your purpose in giving away these rocks? Well, we want everyone to be legally stoned. <laughs> and, and, and it's true. And people go, well, I need that. Our, one of our back burner projects, I mean, we've got so many different things to do that if, if there was actually three Lisbeths and three Jeffs and we could all be an integrated system, then we might actually make more progress towards doing all the stuff that we could do as artists, musicians, writers, filmmakers, photographers, and networkers. But you just, you're just you physically limited by how many hours there are in a day different things like that. You do have to sleep and stuff. But if we ever did run out of things to do, we, we can always go, well, we'd like to paint a rock for every person on the planet. So we've only got 40,000 done out of, like, what are they saying? There is now 6.7 billion people. So the way we look at it is the earth never charged any human beings to live here. No one ever paid any rent to the earth, but humans have been all too willing throughout the history of what we call civilization, as the Hopis called it, to dig precious things from the land. That's sort of the, the root of a lot of our problems. But we've been willing to take from the earth. We have a problem with, with sort of giving things back to it, although we, we don't really take anything away from the earth, really. We just sort of like move it and, and just destroy it and, and disrupt it and stuff. But anyway, our whole process is about giving and sharing. We like to give things away because it's just, I don't know, it's just our nature. Our nature is to give because the earth gives freely of, of herself for all life to exist. So really it's just our way of sharing the spirit of the earth by sharing our art with people. Very nice. Very well said. The frogs are just kind of for fun. It's about images from nature like little animals and little mandalas and Elizabeth's actually her rocks are even like at the next level she's an incredibly talented person when we first met she had only done one painting and her dad emailed us a photo of from Belgium and I was absolutely blown away I went like wow that's your first painting it was so good it, it really reminded me of a, an early painting by a, a famous American painter named Georgia O'Keeffe and that was her first painting, and so her rocks are almost like at the next level beyond mine in her artwork and stuff. So it's a labor of love. I, I love to, to create, and, and painting is, is one of those ways. I'll, I'll say this about our philosophy of art. It's not even so much about the product or artifact that you end up with, but it's about the process of, of creativity. And so in a way, we're keeping alive the spirit of creativity and the spirit of the indigenous approach to art because as indigenous people all over the planet are slowly being genocided and exterminated out of existence 
we're at least able to, to, to carry the torch of, of a lot of that spirit in us and keep that creative process alive. It's, it's not about doing it for money. We, we survive you know, a little bit from our art, but doing it for money is not the real reason we do it. It's not the main reason. We give away as much as we possibly can. And it's like, that seems to be why we're here. If people could learn how to give and share, we wouldn't have to have banks anymore. Agreed. And couldn't have found a more appropriate place to be taking the Song of the Stone, uh, New Zealand and the Waitaha. These are great connections here. <laughs> Thank you. Ralph's house two days ago. Lovely. Oh, fantastic. Well, my friend, that's a journey that uh, many people around me are taking at the moment. Uh, Barry Brailsford certainly has respect we'd love to hear about about that journey well, we're going back up there later this week to help him create some blogs oh that's spectacular yeah. isn't it yeah. we're going to actually make a little youtube video for him okie dokie well it's amazing this connection with barry brailsford and so looking forward to hearing more of that now, Jeff, we're going to get into some a little bit more serious stuff here. You've been an awesome researcher whilst you've been here. After a decade of dominated by ground wars against the insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan, the drill dubbed Bold Alligator on the eastern seaboard of the USA, namely Atlanta and Virginia, is the largest amphibious exercise conducted by the fleet in the last 10 years. About 20,000 US forces, plus hundreds of British, Dutch and French troops, as well as liaison officers from Italy, Spain, New Zealand and Australia, are, as we speak, taking part in this exercise along the Atlantic coastline and off North Carolina. I saw your blog that the US will be operating all their forms of radar, sonar, Mitten low frequency active systems, HARP, RF weapon systems, nuclear, chemical and biological warfare gear. Since the time that this started, we've seen a total of 160 dolphins beached. 40 of those mammals were successfully refloated, but 120 have died. Jeff, do you have comments on this and Noah's part in this game, please? It's absolutely horrific because this is just like the dolphins that got stranded that's just a tiny amount that made it to shore when you consider how many more might have been killed or, or that they call it um, harassment. But th there's a lot of different important things here. I did a little research and, and found a map that shows where all the, the major U.S. naval vessels are. And as of yesterday, right off of Cape Cod, there was two of the biggest U.S. aircraft carriers, the USS Enterprise, which is the oldest one. It's the one that's going to head over to the, the Strait of Hormuz so that it might be able to get sunk as part of uh, a false flag thing to, to blame on Iran. That's what other mm -hmm. people are talking about. But the other one is the USS George Herbert Walker Bush, the newest one that came on, uh, got christened in 2009, and it's right there. These things are like floating cities with like thousands of people and every possible kind of destructive technology ever known to exist. And I mean, I'm not an expert or authority on all this stuff, but you can sort of just logically figure stuff out. If they're having a war game, the biggest one in 10 years, it's just likely the reason they have it so they can practice with all their stuff. And so they're probably going to be breaking out, detonating, blowing up every possible thing that they can. We don't actually know that they haven't used tactical nuclear weapons because if you don't have... If if the powers that be control all the radiation monitoring devices or shut them down, like has been done in the wake of Fukushima, there's no way to know that this stuff is out there. Your body can't detect it. You know, just like you, you can't, there's a lot of things like that. But so I think it's absolutely horrific. Um, the whole situation with, with what's happening with the whales and dolphins, is, it's so, it's beyond belief because they're so perfectly adapted to, to living in the oceans of this planet. But before the advent of industrial civilization. But the, the, the whole ambient environment of the oceans is, is becoming increasingly uninhabitable for all the life forms that have lived there for so long. Um, these war games, what they do... Okay, you were asking about... Um, like I've been involved with um, the whales and dolphins in my background in biology and people have networked with people for, for, for two or three decades about the whales and dolphins and marine biology and related issues. And just in the past two or three years, I've learned from people who actually know a lot more than me 
uh, in a lot of ways. They told me point blank. They looked like the Navy bought off almost every marine biology researcher or institution in the world. And the reason is because, A, they've got an infinite amount of money, and, B, almost all researchers will ultimately go to work for whoever will pay them the most money. So they don't have a problem with it. Even, I've got to mention a name. This really blew me away. There's a guy named Jim Nolman, who I knew back from the early days with uh, working with John Lilly's lab in uh, California. Jim Nolman is a guy that founded an organization called Interspecies Communication. And for a couple of decades, he was like the world leader in talking about animal intelligence and communicating with animals. And tried, he tried to play a little guitar with killer whales and stuff like that, but uh, he went to work for the Navy two years ago. Even him. I couldn't mm-hmm. believe it. I could not believe it. And it's like, uh, but, but what they do, they, they, like uh, the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, according to a, a woman named Rosalind Peterson, and I believe you might have interviewed her before. Yes, we have, yes. She's a really fantastic person. Her website is the Agricultural Defense Coalition.org. She's a fantastic researcher, and I network with her. Um, she, she's who first told me about that the NOAA receives massive funding from the Navy. And um, the, the Navy, uh, there's a branch of the NOAA called the National Marine Mammal, the National Marine and Fisheries Service, or something like that. Anyway, it's a, an organization that the Navy has to get permits from to do all their testing and stuff. Well, anyway, a couple of years ago, and then even recently, just even a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, this guy in Hawaii sent me an email from the Federal Registry from the Library of Congress, and it showed a document where the the U.S. Navy just sent in a new permit to the NOAA requesting that they be allowed to, they use the word take, T-A-K-E, to take an unlimited number of marine mammals from 70 species of cetaceans and 24 species of pinnipeds, which I think is like seals and walruses and stuff like that. And un- I mean, the, 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 their permit from a couple of years ago was asking that they be legally allowed to take, which means kill, 11.5 million animals over the next five years. But now, there's no numerical value. Now, for all practical purposes, it's unlimited. And so, I mean... I have a problem. It's just collateral damage to these people. I mean, it's mm-hmm. simply put, and it's so sad. They want to clear really? the ocean out. The, these mm-hmm. the marine mammals are bogies on their sonar, and they they might think it was an enemy vessel. So if there's if there's nothing mm-hmm. swimming in the ocean, then they're free to have their war. Have their war. They're sick. Very, very, very sick people. So, in fact, the Navy funds and or directly controls almost all marine biology researchers and institutes in the Western world? Well, I think that that's not an unfair generalization. Again, you'd you'd have to, a lot of it they try to keep secret, but but one of the main institutions that that basically may as well be a branch of the Navy is the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution because, I mean, if you just look at, they they operate vehicles that the Navy built and gave to them. Um, Another reason that this is important is because Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute sent out its guy named Ken Busler to go and conduct uh, a survey of the Pacific Ocean and to see what the, con- le- radi- the levels of radioactive contamination were from Fukushima. But if you look at all the organizations that went on his cruise, every one of them is either from a military-related or a government-related or... A, Every university receives massive funding from the Pentagon and, and the military and stuff like that. So, in other words, what these people do, they go out there, they take these readings, and they, they're, and, and, and I predicted this is what he was going to say, and, it, and it, it was what they said. They go like, yeah, there's some radiation there, but it's at safe levels. And, mm. and any biologist from the Manhattan Project, any, any biologist that, that's not either totally brainwashed or, or working for, for the nuclear industry, they'll tell you that there is no safe label, level of ionizing radiation at all. No safe level. So it's well, we, we saw a lot of this ionizing radiation in our skies in 2009, 2010, before and during the Christchurch quakes, and a lot of people became very, very sick during that time. Jeff, uh, you're quite right that we really... 
have no idea how much we've been experimented on here with this, have we? Absolutely. Um, just to maybe to close the thought about the dolphin stranding and stuff, there's um, a lot that have happened in Nelson, um, and, and you were um, you guys on the contrail there were making the correlation between the, the presence of some of these uh, um, seismic exploration vessels um, who are using... They, they might use, do, use technology for electromagnetic surveys and or seismic surveys that use air guns and stuff. But the, the, the whole thing is, um, I think there's a couple of important points. That there's, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg with what's happening with the whales and dolphins because yes. they live at sea. They live at sea. They spend most of the time underwater, so they're, they're hard to study anyway. But the ones that wash up on shore is just would be a, probably a very, 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 very tiny fraction of all the ones that have been harmed and damaged and that, that, that didn't make it to shore and stuff like that. But mm. I think when you see the when you see a, a, the worst dolphin stranding in ten years on Cape Cod, and then you just look and see that two of these giant aircraft carriers are just right there, I'd say there's a very good chance that something that they did caused it, regardless of what the NOA public relations people tell us in the newspapers and stuff. Mm-hmm. Same Agreed. with the stranding in Dolphin with uh, in Nelson. Well, and those yeah. dolphins are very sophisticated users of sound, and they, they depend on sonar. They use sonar, and so when you're blasting these sounds into the ocean for the seismic surveys and whatever else, God knows what else they're doing out there, I think a lot of these strandings are these whales and dolphins just trying to get away yeah. from that. We only see the tip of the iceberg with what's really well, 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 document. They really see they still most of the time underwater, underwater yeah. so they're, they're hard to study anyway. But the ones that are on shore are just He's a, a policy analyst for the National Research <coughs> Defense Council, and I've got a lot of questions about them. They're a, a big organization. Robert Redford does videos for them and stuff. They, any organization like that, when they, they're they're always asking you to give money to them, and and you can't really you can't really fully trust them, but but, but yeah. they they have had some. They're one of the few organizations keeping alive the whole issue of the, the low frequency and mid frequency sonar and its effect on cetaceans and the whole global problem of the the acoustic environment of what's happening in the ocean, the noise pollution levels, and they're talking about how. The, level, the overall sound level has been increasing by about five decibels every year for the past several years, and so it's like they're, they're it's like it's like they're effectively blinded. They're blinded by the noise, and the, the noise. If you think of how many, probably tens of thousands of giant ships go, go around the oceans all the time, and this is just commercial commercial traffic, not even to mention military exercises and stuff, and all the seismic explorations, noise from drilling platforms, it would be, and see, if, from a physics perspective, sound, which is a mechanical vibration, it travels much more intensely and quickly in water than it does in air. And so some of these the, these sonars or even these explosive charges like these air guns and stuff, of which I was researching, that some of them can emit a single pulse of power that's um, at 30,000 kilojoules or 30,000 watts of power. That, that's, I mean, that that's a lot. That's like, I mean, if that's bigger than a blast of dynamite, it, it explodes their inner ear. This is evil. Right. Well, in um, northern Peru, authorities are puzzled by the deaths there, and over 200 dolphins were found there. It's just... It's getting sickening, and when you when you put it in those terms of sound traveling in water and actually being amplified in the water, and these creatures live in the water, there's nowhere for them to run. There's really nowhere for them to hide except for to try to beach themselves to get away from that sound. I personally think that that the whales and dolphins are they're such high beings spiritually that I really this is one of the things that we hope to explore in our our film that we're working on. But I think that they're their consciousness is so different from ours, but it, but it's it's like us in so many ways because we're mammals who live on the same planet. We breathe air, we give birth to our young, and have love and advanced social systems and stuff. But their consciousness is so different because they've been here so much longer than us, and they have no, they don't have hands, they don't have any material objects, and I think that they're they're much more intimately connected with each other and with the consciousness of the earth because they haven't created an artificial reality. 
that that has become that has supplanted their real relationship with the earth and with each other. So they they they're much more tightly knit and spiritually and psychologically interconnected with each other. And I personally think that for a, a, a whale or a dolphin to undergo what we call death, which I think is a, a bad word for that process, I, I don't think that they, they're probably already there. In other words, it may not be a, a traumatic transition like it is for a lot of people to go into a, a higher dimension of consciousness because they, they already live in that permanently anyway. It's just kind of a speculation. It's not fair for us to impose on not just the whales and dolphins, but every other life form on the planet by the effects of our industrial civilization. It's interesting, isn't it, that uh, our marine life are are getting it right at the time where we really need the vibration, the higher vibration held for our Gaia, for our planet, for our mother. It's just mass slaughter. slaughter. Some people have speculated that that the Navy is actually targeting the whales and dolphins on purpose. Yes. Well, I was just going to say, I have watched some interactions, and I haven't um, witnessed it personally. I wish that I could. I have watched interactions with dolphins and humans, and they are such intelligent beings, and their consciousness is so much higher. They have no fear. You know, they are friendly towards us, and, and look what we as as a whole are doing to them. It, it, to me, it's just so sad. But they love you. They love people. I mean, when you, you look in their eyes, and it's like they, they, you can just feel the love. That, that, that's their natural state. And um, even the ancient Greeks, I believe it was Pliny the Elder, wrote about the dolphins have what all philosophers value more than anything else, but which no man is capable of. But the dolphins give us friendship for no advantage. Yes. They're friends to people, even though they stand to benefit in no way from being friendly to people, or, or even are at risk and endangered by people. But yet, they, they never... I won't say that there's... There's never been any cases of dolphins being aggressive towards people because there, there's some though, of a case where the, the dolphin was in captivity and after it, it had been, been there for a couple of years, one of the, the researchers was in there with it and it, it, it beaked him in the chest. Like it, it hit him in the chest with his beak so hard that it, it really hurt him. It didn't hurt him really seriously, but it was like a message that that dolphin was not happy to be there. Mm-hmm. That's why I, I'd already disassociated myself from this organization because I didn't think it was right for me to be keeping the dolphins captive, but they could easily bite, they could just bite your head right off if they wanted to, but they, they don't do stuff like that. They're not aggressive. In fact, they put up with, you know, th- that's the sort of a, a sign of a very high being is to have that level of patience with a lower life form like us. Well, I remember an experience that uh, we're bodies and a few years back now, we were in the Tory Channel, it was 4.30, in the morning we were heading over to Ferno Lodge to get one of our people on board back to work and daughter was standing on the back of the deck and a pot of dolphins was all around us but one of these came out of the water and just sat, it seemed like an eternity, sat on its tail on top of the water eyeballing my daughter, all I could see was absolute, pure, unadulterated love. You know, she was just a youngster then and it was so, it was just beautiful. It was probably one of the most magic moments of our life. Amazing creatures. I think they like kids because kids basically have a a more open, you know, they're not carrying around baggage and stuff so much. Maybe maybe not these days, but, but traditionally kids are much more open. And so the, the, like, they're like the dolphin. Yeah? They don't have these big walls of um, psychic exactly. block. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, oh, but, it was but, a be- you know, beautiful thing. We, we find ourselves going like, well, yeah, the U.S. Navy is the biggest threat to dolphins and whales, and there's all these organizations out there doing all this heavy stuff like Anadarko Petroleum and stuff. But, but ultimately, all these organizations are made of people in many ways like ourselves. And I, I keep trying to say that I, I really think that If we step back and and look at everything that's happening as people are doing, it's being done by people, and it's really us. It's it's the human species that's doing all those things that are a problem. So that way, it makes it a more of of, it makes us all responsible for what we're all doing. You know. What one wonders how how human we can really call these monsters that are in charge of our war machines. Though, Jeff, you know, at the end of the day, what is going on is not human. I mean, we're here, we're loving beings. The, the people that I meet in the street are full of love. Perhaps they're full of fluoride too, but uh, certainly the folk that are warring around us are, 
are different beings altogether. Look, but you know, fine. Jeff, we're, we're currently looking at in Christchurch. There's wetland bird toll has hit 800. I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Christchurch I, I City saw Council. That, yeah, that, 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 I, I wouldn't trust what the council researchers tell you. Not at all. And you know, they're saying that the death of more than 800 birds found along the banks of the oxidation ponds in, at the city's wastewater treatment plant. Uh, they've also been found at other wet, wetlands in the city, by the way. So it's very interesting. The National Institute of, dare I say, War, Water and Atmospheric Research, and we know they're all involved here with the cover-up of the chemtrail issue, and Fish and Game are, are trying to determine how they died. But, of course, we're just going to be fed that they died of avian botulism, you know, a natural phenomena. I was sitting here just a few days ago, Jeff, and we suddenly my computer my internet went down like just completely crashed and it hasn't done that for a long time I have a new modem my daughter at the same time my daughter's computer went to black screen crashed down and a bird smashed into my front window completely stunning itself now all of these things happened within seconds of each other my heart rate went right through the roof so you know it's possible don't forget folk that there's a lot of electromagnetic frequency being ripped around us at the moment we had a high reading of radiation down in Dunedin also last week which travelled the country so you know don't, don't be sucked into this mainstream drivel they're, they're just there to cover up and it's time people took their, their goggles off Jeff I was just going to say there's a guy on the contrail I forget his name Jake or something but he, he posted something that was a couple of maps that show the concentration of microwave mobile phone towers in New Zealand and in Christchurch. The cell phone uh, towers that have gone up, the green towers that have gone up all over Christchurch, which has been a phenomenal mess. I mean, the people down there are waking up on mess. I'd say that the electromagnetic density of Christchurch is probably far denser than any normal fog that we'd ever encounter. Someone on the contrail posted a map, one of which showed all the non-mobile phone towers in New Zealand, and then there was one that zoomed in onto Christchurch and showed the non-mobile phone towers there. I, I cannot believe how many there were. There must have been several hundred. There was a guy, I believe his name was Jason from the Contrail, who contacted the Christchurch City Council and asked them some specific questions, and then he put the answers that they gave, and just like you'd expect, it was really standard answers, of, you know, saying that none of, none of the levels were harmful to any, anybody or life forms or anything like that, but I felt weird vibes in Christchurch ever since I first came there 10 years ago. I never was sure what it was, but just in the past year of connecting with you guys and Penny Hargreaves and stuff and realizing the, the incredible density of radio frequency transmitters and stuff there, I don't know if it's higher than a typical big city, you know, like New York or Melbourne or something like that, but it seems like way too much for an environment that people live in. And the, the danger, just like with ionizing radiation, is all this stuff is invisible. I mean, if people could see those beams shooting out through the air, they'd go, whoa, we're not going to live here, but because they, they can't see it or detect it, but they, and you yourself especially, you're one of the more sensitive people, but you're like the canaries in the coal mine, we're literally being cooked. And a lot of people are, they're, they're so out of touch with their body and their own physical being that they don't even, they're not really aware of that this is going on, or if it is, they might just attribute it to something else, like how much liquor they drank the night before or something like that. Yeah, that's very true. And unfortunately, everything that's going on to dumb people down, you know, I see them line up at the medical centres when, you know, all these things are going on. They go, they're going there for their antidepression pills and, and painkillers. I've been through this process myself, but now that I know what's going on, it's much easier to, to deal with. Now, folks, we have we pre-recorded the first part of the show, and it actually, out of five hours, we actually managed to get 30 minutes of time because we were interfered with electronically so much. It was a phenomenal exercise. This hasn't happened to us for a very, very long time. Since that, that advent, I discovered the electrical issues here on this end I'm broadcasting from Kaikoura are likely due to the fact that we've got research ships back in our waters here which I warned people about last month but we had a 3.1 quake in Kaikoura yesterday and uh, I can tell you we felt every bit of what they were doing for days it was depressing it was very very hard to hold it together emotionally if you're not aware what's going on with you 
And it's just so easy to think you're going nuts. So once that quake happened, the pressure was released. The skies, the skies cleared early this morning. Of course, they've been spraying us like bugs ever since, and uh, the pressure's back on us. Note that electrical issues are usually a really good sign that, that there's something coming. So keep an eye on that. Another person I was speaking to in Christchurch just a couple of days ago said that just before the three quakes, his television went AWOL for hours beforehand, like from 6 to 12 hours beforehand, his television screen would pixelate, and this has never happened before. So some of the things that you can keep your eye on for this. Textbook radio frequency sometimes in effect mm. in, in the exact same way that... Alaskan seals that, it, that they found dead and dying in the Aleutian Islands show textbook signs of radiation poisoning, although the government investigators go, well, um, well we're just not, we're not sure what this is. It's, it's an unknown cause, but it's textbook radiation poisoning. What you're describing is textbook radio frequency poisoning and interference with biological systems. It's been known for decades. So the, the powers that be, part of their whole operation is public relations geared to denying and, and, and putting the blame on something else. Right, and you know, just so that people are aware, I have my own very recent experiences with these RF frequencies where I became very ill. Um, I was crying uncontrollably, could not have a, a valid thought in my head. I could not concentrate and seems to have been ramped up in the United States. I've talked to several people and have, re have had responses from several people in the United States where they're saying they're being um, more, more affected by this within the last week or so. So just so that people are aware, you know, I'd strongly recommend that you look up RF frequency and radiation um, RF illness and see what the signs and symptoms are because they mimic signs and symptoms of a lot of other things and especially if you're not aware of what to look for. As soon as I took precautions, within minutes I started feeling better and this went on for days. So it's very important that we inform ourselves about what these side effects are, the human side effects, so that you recognize what's going on when it's happening to you. The, the way that these technologies are used as a weapon against bio biological life forms is, is the pulsing, the pulsing of these energies rather than a continuous boom. And, and if you think about it, that's exactly what we've got going through our past circuitry. It's called alternating current, invented by Nikola Tesla. It's pulsing off and on at 60 hertz per second, which is a very unnatural rhythm. But we're, for decades, we've been living with pulsed radio frequency energy around us all the time and they're amping up the power levels. I think the, the more time you can spend away from anything electrical, the better. I agree and folks, we've also had this confirmed by Dr. Gwen Scott. She saw a uh, comment in the, on the contrail this morning that said that she has now connected the radio frequency to what's going on with her. Now Dr. Gwen Scott has more gallons and she is an expert in the subject. She's worked with Cliff Carnicom on this amazing woman we have interviewed her so you can go to the Contrail DOT com on YouTube to find those archives but we're all sort of coming to the same conclusions from all over the world the radio network took over here in 1996 didn't they Jeff and you've got a little bit of information on that with, with what happened with Christchurch with the radio towers at that time. Yes, I, I don't really know all that much. Penny, Penny Hargraves, who we've mentioned before, she's the real authority on this because one of these really major transmission towers is called Orahuria. Is that how it's pronounced? Orahuria, yep. That tower was located right on the back corner of her property. And she finally figured it out after literally being fried. Her horses and other farm animals were coming down with all your standard symptoms of radio frequency poisoning. Some of them, I think, died. She was getting physically, physically ill herself, and she finally started figuring it all out, traced out, started doing a lot of research and networking with people and scientists around the world, and mapped out that, that she was right in the crossfire between, she was physically closer to the... Oh, really? Oh, really? That one. Oh, really? But that and the Sugar Love Tower was on the opposite side of town, and she sort of mapped out the beams where these cross, and in... The area where these beams cause, like you were mentioning yesterday, this seems to be the area of the greatest earthquake damage levels and the greatest amount of liquefaction and stuff. And, and what this, to me, is is a local example of a global phenomenon using 
what what I came up with to call the uh, the, the tetrafuse paradigm, the technolo the technotronic Tesla based radio frequency energy weapons. The word technotronic, um, I don't know if Bigney Brzezinski coined the word, but I first saw it in his book. The use of radio frequency energy as a weapon. The, the basic concept goes back to Tesla, but we were talking yesterday too. Most people think of the word HARP, the High Frequency Active Rural Research Project. People think of that, they use that as the name for all of this technology, but it, accurately it's just one installation out of 20. There may be hundreds or thousands more of varying sizes and types of technology that are mobile. So technotronic weapons are the summation of all of these technologies taken together as a whole. And I believe that it's all being wielded as a weapon system. And in, in the world, this ties us in with the Anadarko thing that we'll talk about later. Anadarko Petroleum is just one of many energy exploration and extraction companies who, because of the, the nature of what's happening in government and business today, um, what we're seeing is the unfoldment of the, the true definition of fascism, which is a complete merger of state and corporate power. So really, a corporation like this is indistinguishable from a military operation. And it's even got military people, military-grade technologies. Military uses the same kind of technology that the oil exploration companies use. For all practical effects, it's the exact same thing. So we're all sort of under attack people, all the life forms on the land and sea and the air, the earth herself. We're all under attack by all these technologies, both as unintended side effects. We're all under attack either indirectly and directly being targeted with these technologies. We certainly are, and, and there's a number of things that are happening along with that. And, uh, people that know me know that I've had that I lost use of my arm in 2010 where we were being seriously poisoned and microwaved. So lots of different things happened here. I won't go back over that stuff, but uh, one of the things that I have noticed and I learned this from Penny Hargraves was the amalgams in, in our mouths. Kiwis are full of amalgams. We were real test rats when, you know, back in the 70s here. And uh, the amalgams in my mouth, which have been perfectly stable up until I moved onto this property under a microwave beam, are now deteriorating at such a rapid rate. Now, Penny tells me that this is because when you're in these beams, it seems to amplify the bacterial uh, breakdown. You know, so we're seeing things like uh, yellow and green lichen growing where the beams are, are placed. And uh, it seems that it's messing with our amalgams. So it's a really good time, guys, if you've got those things in your, in your mouth to get them out because you're being seriously poisoned. You know, I don't know what damage this does to... Uh, sea life, I mean, our seas are full of mercury as well, so, you know, the, the fish is coming up being tested all over the place, just loaded with mercury, so it's all part of the well, game. New research just came out last week, or a few weeks ago, saying that, actually, they've now determined that mercury is a, a vital, essential nutrient, and that the reason that people, we're, <laughs> have, we're having outbreaks of mercury deficiency, which is manifested in the sense of, like, if you have joy, or if you feel happy and healthy and energetic and creative and can actually enjoy your life, you've got mercury deficiency. <laughs> <laughs> and the propaganda is never ending, isn't it? <laughs> that if you're, you need that, they need to put some mercury and strontium-90 and fluoride all in, in one big pill that you can just swallow. But we, we must thank Anthony Gucciardi of the Natural Society for a brilliant mercurial satire that he did. Certainly, and actually I put that link in uh, chat because it is, it is such a good read. It, it was really, really fun. Now that, that link there, folks, is on one of Jeff's blogs and we've been linking those to you in the chat rooms today. Je Jeff's a fantastic researcher and, and artist, so if you can pop in there and you won't be disappointed if you um, connect with his blogs. I'll tell you that Mercury article that you're speaking of is one of my favorites. As being somebody that uses sarcasm as a second language, I really related very well <laughs> to that article. I, I strongly recommend people read it. He used all the all the the essential key terms that like the the, the CDC is the Center for Disease Creation. But you have to be careful. There are people that would actually go and wow. Wow, so mercury is a nutrient after all. I better, I'm going to eat my thermometer. <laughs> mercury is saving people just so that you know. <laughs> that's, where, that's where the expression mad as a hatter comes from because 
people that used to make hats a long time ago somehow used a lot of mercury. But it's, it's there in the emissions from coal-fired power plants. It's in um, canned food, especially tuna. It's in uh, when another way that a lot of mercury enters the environment is from the cremation of people's bodies that have amalgam fillings and it just burns up and it goes into this mercury smoke up into the atmosphere. That's pretty creepy. But you want to get that stuff out of your body because I've, I've, these electrical fields probably affect it in many ways. Anything metal in your body would be affected by something, by radio frequency or microwave energy. Absolutely, and I've experienced this myself. I mean, I know when they're uh, zapping us, we have to leave the house when this goes on because my teeth just hurt like hell. And uh, there is metal in different parts of my body, and I feel that going off too. So we really can survive this if we can understand those little signs that our bodies are giving us all the time. Uh, visiting Penny Hargraves was just such an enlightening experience for me to understand what my God was doing. And as I said last week, there's no way that I will... Well, I am actually. I'm going back to Christchurch next week. But my experience down there was absolutely horrific after being under all these green towers and visiting these radio towers. And I can't even tell you how ill I was. I just came home and was so grateful to be sitting under my Tetra Tower here because <laughs> it wasn't nearly as bad as everything going on in Christchurch. You suddenly, so. well, what about all the people that don't notice it? Hmm. They, they're being affected, they, they just don't notice. And as I said earlier, they line up to go and get a pill to fix it, and it's just feeding the monster. What I have noticed is that a lot of Cantabrians are drinking. You know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, alcohol being consumed right now. And of course, that's just part of the game, isn't it? Right. You know, well, people start feeling badly and they don't know why, so they start uh, over. Self-medicating, I think, is what the the issue is, and you know, like you were saying, Rose, the same is, is true over here. Our clinics are lining up with people going into the doctor because they know something's wrong, but they have no frame of reference to relate this to. So I think it's, I just think it's so important that people educate themselves on this issue. That they they're bound to bring out the soma. You remember from Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Soma was the free drug that the government gave you that made everything okay, and you couldn't OD on it. If you took too much, you just fell into a deep, refreshing slumber. <laughs> yeah, dangerous prospect in these times, I believe. <laughs> Well, something, folks, if you do have your mercuries out, and I mean, I think I'm just going to have my teeth pulled out. I'm just done with this stuff. I can't afford to have it replaced. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, I couldn't give a rat and go around being a bit gummy, but, uh, you know, it's, this is not about ego anymore. This is about surviving. But there are things that you can do to help your detox there, and high doses of vitamin C uh, uh, are one of the things that can help you do that. I mean, there's a New Zealand product that is available that your body doesn't throw out because we all know that vitamin C, if you dose up on it, it'll just chuck out what, what it doesn't need. Well, there, is a, there are products available that, that you can use to help that process. So, you know, it's preferable to go and get it all done at once rather than one at a time because you, otherwise your body's under constant detox stress. I understand it, it has to do with the, the relative pH of your body, too. If you're, if, you're, if you're fairly neutral, then I think it's... A lot of people's bodies are a little on the acidic side, and I think that makes the the amalgam react even more. But uh, I also read that that there's a type of cherry, like the fruit. It's called the acerola cherry. It's A C E R O L A. I'm not sure if it grows in New Zealand, but it has a substance called malic acid that's supposed to be really brilliant for getting metal uh, un harmful metals out of your body. I'm looking forward to meeting with you and Elizabeth in person, and we've we've got a lot of information here to share. Absolutely, and we'll have to go up and, and see Barry Brailsford at Castle Hill. Come back to Barry actually very soon because that is something that is just so important. It just blew my mind that you are connected there and this is such an important part of New Zealand's journey right now with the, the Waitaha. Anadarko's board members are all, all harpists, star harpists. Can you just the price, the you know, <laughs> <laughs> Now, Anadarko, folks, for, for the, those of you, you that don't know, they have a, a seabed flotilla. Basically, it's a privatised war machine that is currently running around New Zealand, mapping uh, everything, seismic mapping. Uh, for, <laughs> Cleverly, guys, it's seismic mapping. <laughs> 
they were here legally. Uh, before the, in the Christchurch quakes happened, and we're starting to connect dots there with wherever these ships are. There are frequently quakes. Now, after the killer quake that happened in February, the, day, the people were pulling bodies out of the rubble, and the government signed up the very next day to allow these bastards to come in and rape us with their minerals. They'd already been doing it, of course, but nobody was aware. And that's why we saw this huge advent of chemtrails, because it's all part of the oil industry's technology. They have to fill us up with barium so they can x-ray us, folks. So uh, if you could just tell us what you, you've learned about this, please, Jeff. Well, I, I, I first heard of them from the contrail, and I, uh, you were talking about uh, the boat um the Aquila, yes. The Aquila, and I just, you know, you can just Google, you can Bing it, or other search engines, but it's easy to access. You just do like a Wikipedia search for Anadarko board members, and you find out who they are, assuming that this is all accurate information, which, I mean, honest to God, all this stuff, you don't know for sure about it all, unless you're actually, if you know the people and stuff, but, but based on the veracity of Google and Wikipedia and all this stuff, this is what I've come up with. So if, if you look at their board, it's got a very interesting array of people. Uh, I noticed that the, the, the CEO is a guy called James Hackett, but he's also either A or the main director of Halliburton, which is a company that Dick Shaney, well known to be one of the primary architects of 9-11, Shaney, that was his company, or still is. They're, so I call them War Incorporated because they go, they are the U.S. military mega machine contractor. They go, they build the military bases everywhere and all the support infrastructure and, and who knows what else, but they're also heavily involved in the oil exploration and extraction industry. And uh, they're related to a company called Brown and Root. It actually used to be a, the company that was owned by Avril Harriman, who was the business partner of George Prescott Bush, the granddad of the last president, uh, who got actually in trouble for doing business with the Third Reich in Nazi Germany. So Halliburton has all these kind of connections, and Hackett is the director of Halliburton. He's also a member of the Trilateral Commission, which is was formed by Big New Brzezinski on behalf of David Rockefeller back in the, I'm not sure when it was, the 1960s or 70s, but the Trilateral Commission is one of the primary organizations in the world that's devoted to creating a one-world government. And again, I don't claim to be an expert on any of this stuff, but there's bits and pieces that you pick up here and there, but that's Hackett. Um, it's, it's known that James Hackett came and paid a personal visit to John Key last November when he was here. Um, then you've got Paula Reynolds, this was interesting. She's on the board of Anadarko. She is actually a or the director of a company called BAE Systems. I forget what it stands for, but I knew who they were because I remember re reading about some research on HARP, the actual HARP facility in Alaska. BAE received a $30 million contract to build the Phase two part of HARP, which was to expand its power level up to like a billion watts or something like that, There, she controls the company that did that. Then there's a guy called uh, Pete Guerin, who used to be Secretary of the Army and the Air Force. That's a very top military position. Luke Corbett, who was the director or still is of a company called Carmagee that used to be owned by Peabody Cole. Carmagee is a plutonium reprocessing facility in Oklahoma. That's where a woman named Karen Silkwood worked there, and they made a movie about what happened to her. She realized they were all getting contaminated with plutonium. Then she found plutonium on baloney in her refrigerator, and she knew she was going to die, and she was run off the road and killed on her way with, to take evidence to a journalist. So this guy is the head of that company. And then the coolest one of all, Former NASA shuttle astronaut, General Kevin Chilton. He used to be a NASA astronaut for about 12 years. He piloted three shuttle missions and was involved with the International Space Station. And when you start looking into that, a lot of the space station stuff and the shuttle missions have had to do with experiments and technologies related to the technotronic weapons, chemtrails and HARP and stuff like that. Uh, Marin Murray talked about a guy named Dr. Bernhardt who conducted experiments where they would fire the orbital thrusting engines on the shuttle for long periods of time because the chemicals 
spewing out from this rocket engine and up in the ionosphere, they were going to inject, it was, it's, in other words, it was like spraying a giant chemtrail up into the ionosphere out through the engines of the space shuttle. So it's possible that this dude was piloting some of those. You can figure it out because they tell you what all the missions did and stuff, but, but he also then went on to become the commander of what used to be called the Strategic Air Command. That was inside the Cheyenne Mountain in, in Colorado. That's where they control all the nuclear weapons and all that stuff, the missiles and everything. And then they changed the name to STRATCOM. So this dude was the head of that. This is like a huge position. He was the head of that and as well as the whole United States Cyber Security Command and the Space Command. This dude he was in charge of all this stuff, but when you look at him, he looks like a high school science teacher with a uniform on. And when you listen to him talk, there, there's an interview. I've, I've, there's links to all this on my blog, but uh, there's, he was interviewed by this guy named Charlie Rose, who uh, is a famous interviewer. Who He himself is actually a member of the Trilateral Commission, I saw. But, uh, and, but if you listen to Kevin Chilton speak, he's a very soft-spoken, gentle guy. He's always downplaying the, the power of America. He's going like, well, yeah, you know, you know, we're just kind of trying to do the best we can in a hostile world, and we're we're sort of getting we're not under attack with cyber warfare, but we're being probed by China. And you know, and he, he makes it sound like America's just this kind of lowly good guy that's sort of under attack by all these evil forces, and they're just kind of like trying to hold up as best they can against all this stuff. It's just PR. It's exactly the opposite of the actual truth. But anyway, but these five people, there's maybe several more members of the board, but they sound more kind of like they're like investment bankers and bureaucratic accountants and people like that. But, but these five people alone would all be highly aware of the whole technotronic weapons thing. And um, when, I, when I realized that and realized that they had actually owned this flotilla of boats, it's operated by a company called Seabird, which is out of Florida, but who knows who they own. And then there's another company called Polarcus that had some exploration vessels here. and But they, they were formed by people that used to work for Seabird. I found that out too. So it's really all one big happy family. But So in, all these people and organizations would have to be extremely aware of what they're doing with using these electromagnetic, electromagnetic survey technologies, the seismic towed air gun array exploration technologies. They would have to know what they're doing and not only that, they're all working in conjunction with each other. They know where all these other boats are. Um, and if, you, if these companies are directly tied in with the whole military apparatus, which they more than likely are, then it's a, a giant global mega machine with presence everywhere. Everywhere there's one of these boats, everywhere there's U.S. aircraft carriers or seismic exploration boats, it's possible that it's all being wielded as one integrated war fighting network, especially with what's happening with the, the massive buildup over towards Iran and all this stuff. It, it could all be linked together and amped up as the most ultimate war fighting global apparatus that, that's ever seen, and it's really scary to think about. But. These buggers are in our waters right now, and, and we had news, you know, a month ago that they would be here, but uh, they've blocked a lot of these ships off the ship finder, and we can't find Aquila right now, so Quake here yesterday, I know they're around, and I know what's been happening to us. My daughter is particularly sick at the moment. She hasn't been sick since she was a toddler, so this is, this is better. That. She's a lot better, yeah, she's had a lovely dose of all things that are good for you, peroxide in the ears, she's had um, her iodine, she's had vitamin C boost, she's had colloidal silver, so you know there's just so many things, a bit of garlic never goes amiss, I know it's a neurotoxin but heck, you know, it's even even killed my toothache today uh, so if I'm sounding a bit stupid it's because I've just eaten a pile of garlic <laughs> ok, so basically we have a floating war machine and it's been privatised and it's all around us, so all this stuff guys with Nibiru's coming to bite us and whatever, ok, look, you can be taking down those rabbit holes and, and you know, those things may in fact be happening not right now, but that's where you're, you're being dragged to with all the propaganda um, you know, you might wait, wait for another 20 years for that one to come but, but right now please realise that, that the ring of fire is being is absolutely under attack by the US military and their finance of course is all uh, there's a lot of other people involved with that but, but what is going on around the ring of fire 
is, is less than natural. There may be natural events taking place within it, but these people love the chaos. So uh, with that in mind, we're going to go to a music break here. Now, Jeff's got some fantastic music that he's played with over, over time. So this is one of his pieces, and uh, we'll be right back after this short break. Product, 
this is a machine. Well, we never really know what we really, really mean. It's infotoxin, flooding our senses. Moving out the present now, a step in short time. It's infotoxin, causing a cry. Sense of mediocrity, but not more. Consuming Earth's resources, increasing profit cells. Selling things that no one needs, but no one can rebel. Against the exploitation games which keep us all apart. Everyone I know, it seems, is a player from the start. An infotoxin. Putting a lot of symptoms. Living out of present now. Infotoxin. Most certainly from total mediocrity. But not in Oh, if you think politicians will our problems only solve, you'd assume the lead better if it's not around the sun revolve. The answer is why in us, my friends, we and they and you. The lives we have, the life we share, is made by us. By us? Yes, us. It's true. So watch out for them. Infotoxin. What do you think all our senses? Living out of present now. What's the future chances? Infotoxin. Totally mediocrity, but not much. Einstein's brain. 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 The song is called uh, Threshold Infotoxin. It's a techno rap recorded by and produced by Jeff. Uh, this song managed to get played on over a dozen college radio stations around America and Jeff got to meet Frank Zappa at Berkeley, California. That was for on? a radio station called KPFA. I had taken a tape of this song to the programming manager and, and he liked it and said he'd play but he goes, Jeff, Frank Zappa's going to be here. This, this kind of sounds like something he would do. Why don't you come down and meet him? I just got to talk to him for about five minutes, and he was, he was actually quite intimidating, this dude that was taller than me, and he had on the long black overcoat and stuff, but when he realized that I was friendly, he actually was quite cool, and just talked to him, and later on hung out with two or three dudes that worked for him uh, uh, down in Southern California, but that was a cool connection. He was actually going into politics at the time that he died. What's he now? Isn't that interesting? Well, <laughs> you know, I can tell you some stuff. I, I won't tell the story now, but uh, he had just gone to testify in the U.S. Senate against the Parents Resource Music Council who wanted to impose censorship ratings on the lyrics of all rock music. And Zappa went to the Senate to testify on behalf, on, on behalf of the First Amendment, people's right to free speech. And guess who... Guess who was the head of this um, organization? Tipper Gore, Al Gore's wife. Isn't that wow. interesting? Yeah, wow, gosh, this is such a dirty word word, mate. Yes, I can hear you. I'll, I'll just say uh, the reason I mentioned Einstein's brain at the end of Infotox, and that's the next song I did, it really pissed me off when I read in a science magazine that they saved Einstein's brain in a jar to study it even though they asked him before he died and he told him no and they made a deal with his son after he died he got his brain and studied it and the funny thing was that it wasn't any different from anybody else's his brain was below average and, uh, what do they think? I mean it's, it's not your brain there's even people with this, this condition called hydrocephaly they don't even have a brain literally people have a giant cavity in their head filled with fluid and their, behavioral, their behavior is indistinguishable from a normal person Incredible. most of what normal people do you don't need a brain to do it 
your brain stem can just keep you up and talking and walking around and stuff. Well, yeah, I heard about a chicken that went around, it was alive for a year after it, it had its head cut off because there was enough of its brain stem to keep it, keep it rolling. I heard that too. Oh. There's a website. It was called Mike's, Mike's Headless Chicken. Yeah, well, there's some interesting stuff. And, of course, our heart has a brain, and that's been scientifically proven. So let's develop that one, guys. I mean, at the end of the day, who needs this thing on top of our shoulders? It doesn't seem to have done us any good, but get us into trouble. Well, we're, we're just, you're, my metaphor is that we're, it's, we are the most advanced technology that exists. Anything that's alive is the ultimate technology, but the problem with humanity is that the software we're using inside of our head is completely wrong. We have a totally bogus mental operating environment that, we're, uh, that consists of all the artificial reality that we've fed each other for the past 5,000 years. If we can dump this whole operating system and, and reboot with, with Mother Earth and the cosmos, then everything will work perfectly. But there's nothing wrong with our biology. It's our software. It's just interesting, isn't it? We're learning so rapidly now. Uh, bring it on. Look, you know, Jeff, I want to thank you. That, uh, that tune coming out of the 80s it really, really tickled me. And I know you've done a lot of more recent stuff, but uh, folk like yourself who are creatively minded, I mean, you're an artist first. You're a researcher. You're an artist. But to throw the music in there, I only know one other person like that, and that's Yado, our friend Yado, who is also a co-host. And uh, I would love to connect you with this gentleman. He is actually in our chat at the moment, and uh, it's just awesome to have him here. So, Joy. Uh, we've been talking about some pretty heavy stuff, and so I just kind of wanted to lighten things up a little bit with something that I personally was fascinated with. Um, Jeff. I had heard many years back of a researcher that had recorded dolphins and then slowed down those recordings and discovered that dolphins were mimicking human, human speech yeah. and that they actually heard th that speech from the researchers. And what do you know about that? Well, very interesting. This is a, a very important chapter in my own life. I went to college for three and a half years and studied physics, zoology, and psychology and did really well in the subjects I liked. And at the time, my, my guardian angels were guiding me on the path that I'm on. But it, it was a difficult time. But my physics lab instructor turned me on to the writings of a scientist named Dr. John C. Lilly. And this lab instructor went on to become a plasma physicist at Los Alamos National Laboratory where, where they designed some of the most evil technologies that have ever existed. And the last time I saw him, he said, Jeff, we've just designed a microwave energy uh, device to sell to Russia so you can run, you can chop down a tree and run the tree through this microwave thing and it'll explode the bark off the tree. That's what they were doing. This is the last time I saw him in 1995. Anyway, but I have to thank Ray Stringfield for turning me on to Dr. John C. Lilly. I started reading his books, and it struck a chord in me because he was a biological researcher who became interested in dolphins because they have brains and nervous systems very similar to ours, only even more sophisticated. They actually have everything we have, but the, the whales and dolphins have even another lobe to their brain that only they have out of all the mammals. I, I believe it's called the parietal, the parietal lobe or the parietal occipital lobe. But what it's believed to do is to, to facilitate a higher level of integration between all the different sensory systems. So anyway, I became very interested in Dr. Lowe's work, and his basic concept was that the dolphins and whales really are an extraterrestrial intelligence, but they live on the same planet. And he always made the point of saying that terrestrial means on land. So literally, we live on land. We're terrestrial. They're extraterrestrial. They're off land in the water. And he said, like, well, if we can't communicate with beings with brains even bigger than ours that live on the same planet, what possible hope do we have of being able to communicate with something that's not even from this planet? So he became, he was the only biologist at the first conference organized by doctors Frank Drake and Carl Sagan that gave birth to what later became known as SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So Dr. Lilly was, was doing work with dolphins, and this work struck such a chord in me that I actually went to California and met him and his wife and did a couple of workshops with them at this place called the Esalen Institute. And then I moved there in 1980 to be a volunteer for his new group called the Human Stroke Dolphin Foundation. 
document. It was Dr. Lorley back in the, in the late 50s or early 60s with his original lab in the Virgin Islands. Where now this is before he saw the light. This is when he would still he could still justify killing a dolphin to study its brain. But I think he only did that a couple of times. Uh, and he put electrodes in their brain, and all this stuff. But it was him. The dolphin's name was Elvar. And he w actually listened to tapes. And, and somehow I was inspired to slow him down because he heard these squeaking sounds. And when he slowed it down, just like you said, he realized that it was the dolphin imitating Lily's voice saying the name Elvar. Fascinating. There's incredible beings. I've actually met and swum with dolphins two or three times. Elizabeth and I had a very powerful encounter off the Great Barrier Island a couple of years ago. Um, she had seen dolphins coming you know, along the shore, and they kept coming closer. And one day we were out there swimming in water about a meter deep, and these three dolphins just appeared out of nowhere, came right around us, you know, close enough that we could touch them, except that we didn't. They circled us, then they left, and then they came back and did that two or three times. And we were just dumbfounded because we actually felt like we had been kind of beamed with this energy that, that made us feel really sort of invigorated. But, but another thing that we came away with was that the presence of these dolphins and their, their spirit and consciousness had, in, had warned us. It was like an urgent warning of something bad that was going to happen or, you know, maybe a whole, I don't, I, it was hard, it's hard to actually verbalize it, but it was a sense that we really need, that they knew something that was going to happen really bad. And I don't know if they were talking about Fukushima or just sort of like the whole scenario that, that's going to unfold that's already unfolding, but it's a very, very, very powerful encounter. It's, it, it's just so, to, to read about all these dolphins stranding and dying and all these whales and stuff, you can't grasp it. Right, and I think, like we were discussing before, I think that has an awful lot to do with the fact that their consciousness is so much more advanced than ours is. And, you know, I wouldn't be more surprised to find out that their intelligence is a lot, you know, greater than human intelligence as well. It's just that we haven't been intelligent enough to figure out what they're thinking. <laughs> Again, this is one of the, um, the direction we're going to go with our new Beyond Film project that we're going to make. It's going to be an attempt to sort of go into the minds of the cetaceans, uh, not intrusively, but explorat exploratorially to try to, to use our highest cre creativity to sort of understand what it might be like to be a dolphin or a whale, but it's really hard. They're, they live in the water. They're a lot freer from gravity than we are, but the, the biggest difference is they don't, they don't have hands. They don't manipulate the external world in the same way that we do, and so th that alone is going to give them a very different quality of mentality and consciousness because, uh, and again, it's misleading because there's a lot of, uh, even among the few marine biology researchers that don't work for the Navy, a lot of them are still just out there. They, they're trying to use it as a way to, to get uh, attention for themselves. But there was a, uh, an article I saw two or three weeks ago about some scientists that claim to have discovered the key to understanding the dolphin language. And I've just got to use the word bullshit because they, they don't have language. They, they have extremely sophisticated communication. But only humans have language because language comes from the word ling. It means your tongue. The dolphins don't use their tongue to make sound or communicate. They broadcast the sound from inside their skull. They don't even talk through their blowhole um, like the, like Elbar was using, creating sound through an orifice that they don't even normally use except for breathing. But it was the closest thing he could use to, to make a sound that the humans could hear in air. See, all their sound takes place underwater. Right. Amazing research by that man. I was reading just a very little about the link that I posted up in chat. So. Anybody's interested in that? It's, it's excellent, excellent research, and please look into it. On my blog called Tutanui Wananga, there's a posting on there of uh, Dr. Lilly and his wife asked me to write an article on their behalf for a San Francisco magazine called Magical Blend. Uh, this was in December of 1980, and. Uh, I, I don't believe Magical Blend has an archive of their old material up anymore, but uh, but I put that article in its original form on my blog. Well, I just think I'll drop in here. Another experience that we had when we were living out in the Marlborough Sounds, and this one just was just incredible to me. Dolphin, the, the tour boats, which I don't like. I don't like the tour boats. I don't like it when they dump people in the water to force them into pods. But 
Anyway, at that time we weren't really that enlightened. Our journey, you know, we were living in isolation, so we got our own boat. But so, you know, we could get into town when we needed to, etc. Well, my daughter was turning seven, and she decided that she wanted to go and swim with dolphins, and or go and see the dolphins. And the dolphin crew that were up there at the time, it was the middle of winter, and they were shut for the season. She has a, you know, a midwinter birthday. So Captain Ray got, got his old boat out, Miss Portage, and she sleeps ten. And we picked up a crew, and Paige's uh, other mother and father came to join us, and and her half-brother and, you know, my partner and I, we all went on a journey to find dolphins for, for her for her birthday. Now, on the day of her birthday, she was given a, a huge crystal by somebody that uh, we worked with. So she was given this massive amethyst crystal that was just part of, you know, the amazing day. We went out and we spent three days. We spent three days looking for dolphins and there were none. So we came home all disappointed because that was what she wanted. That was, you know, she did not ever ask much, but she wanted her whole family together and she wanted to see the dolphins. Anyway, we got home and all of us had climbed off the boat, <coughs> off Miss Portage, we got onto our jetty, and then, bugger me, a dolphin just came through and not only did it swim past us, it came right in under our jetty. Uh, and a whole pod just came past. I've never seen this. I've never seen dolphins under our jetty, guys. And my daughter was still on the boat, and her and Captain Ray just honked the horn, and away they went. They had this incredibly special time. Did we tell you that yesterday, just after we were having all the, the electromagnetic attacks and stuff, that um, Lisbeth went out to the ocean and, and, and saw some dolphins here? Can you tell us about that, Jim? Apparently, our friends who live here said that it is fairly unusual to, to see dolphins here. It, it just seemed that they they came at a time when they knew that we'd been talking about them, and they came to them, bring us some good energy and let us know that they were there. Similar thing happened. We were off an island off of Tasmania, out camping, and we were climbing this mountain that's a few hundred meters high, and we're climbing the mountain, and Elizabeth looks out to sea, and she goes, Look, what is that? It looks like a windsurfer. Oh, well, no, it looks like they just fell off. Oh, whoa, it's a giant humpback whale breaching. And we saw that, and we watched them for about 30 minutes. And so then we... Wow. This was totally unexpected. And so then we, we went and camped out, and the next morning we were thinking about them. And we, we were on the other side of the bay the next morning, and we went out just as we had our coffee and went down to look at the water. There they were. And not only dolphins, but also a big, a big whale and some dolphins. They were just like, if they were as close to us as they could be. The water, the, the ocean, was really one body of water over the whole planet. But in, in a regional area, the acoustic environment in the, in the water is going to be very different than the acoustic environment in the air. I mean, there's like a, an interface. So the, the sound vibration seemed fairly quiet to us up above the water. But if we were able to go down under the water and hear at the frequency level of the whales and dolphins, be like a, a a loud cacophony or it, like explosions going off and stuff from all the boats and the, the testing and everything. Um, another thing I'd like to talk about is one of your works that, that you and Lisbeth, your partner, had worked on, and that was the Mother Earth Temple, the Stone oh. Chakra Medicine Wheel in the Interdimensional Park. Um, I wonder if you could describe that for our listeners. I'll, I will pop a link in chat. For the listeners that don't have the link, if you could explain that to them and expand on its purpose and meaning. I will. And again, very interestingly, it started with the dolphins because this is on our friend's property on the island off of Tasmania. His name is Arnie. We call him Arnie Bellani. And he has this property. He's a really interesting guy that used to be in the Swedish Merchant Navy. But in 1985, he bought this land on this remote property. And we've gone there a couple of times. And he lets us just stay as long as we can. He has no electricity. He has no neighbors within several kilometers, except for maybe just a couple of people. But the land he's on has never been farmed, logged, poisoned, or had anything done to it. So it's just about as pristine of an environment as you could possibly find yourself in and still actually live there. So we were, we were there and ended up being able to stay a lot longer than we had initially thought. And for some reason, we, we took it on ourselves to, I won't use the word pretend, but we were going to conduct an experiment and see if we could 
make an effort to grow enough food to survive in case the bottom did drop out of civilization and we were on a place like that, would we be able to actually really grow enough food to live and survive? And we're vegetarians and we don't want to hunt kangaroos or eat possums or something like that. So we had 10 gardens and we were able to eat our own broccoli and stuff. And so I think it can be done. It's a lot of work. And in an environment like that where you've got kangaroos and possums and all these animals coming along and also chickens, which we eat for some eggs and stuff, but we have to protect it from that. So in the, along with making these gardens, it started with making a stone medicine wheel because we had made our very first stone medicine wheel, which is sort of the Native American tradition of a circle of stones for ceremonial purposes. And uh, we made our very first medicine wheel there at Arnie's three years before, two or three years before. So and then we made about another half a dozen on different friends' property in a couple of different countries. So this was the, we came back to Arnie's and I go like, well, let's make a new medicine wheel at because we were living in a little different area there and we had our, a, a much more sort of our own little piece of land to do stuff with and so what started out to be one medicine wheel ended up to turn out to be seven medicine wheels all connected made up uh, consisting of over a thousand rocks that we got from the beach the whole inside of all the medicine wheels is filled with sand that we hauled up from the beach the seven medicine wheels correspond to each of the seven chakras in the human body. At the heart chakra position is a hexagonal kiva, a little structure partially underground. Oh, it's got about a meter and a half worth of headroom down inside. And we can go down in there and, and play music and, and meditate and stuff like that. And inside the first medicine wheel, which was at the crown chakra position, it's the one we started at, I decided to build a thing called a jed pillar. Now, this is very interesting. It was taught to me by my friend Moira Timms, a very interesting person who wrote a book called Beyond Prophecies and Predictions in the mid-90s, um, well before anyone ever talked about 2012. Wrote a really cool book, and she was also an Egyptologist, and she had gone to Egypt and was one of the few people that was able to even pretend that they could translate or understand Egyptian hieroglyphics. And she emphasized to me that the Egyptian language, like some other ancient ones, were really about the the vibrational sound of the spoken word. But she told me of this thing called the Jed Pillar, and it's spelled D-J-E-D. -E it's where the word Jedi comes from. And the Jedi were actually the spiritual body of Osiris, who was an ancient historical king of Egypt, a good guy, before the dark priesthood took over. Os this is according to her. Osiris was a tr truly good and genuine king of Egypt. She said he was like the Jesus of the Egyptians. He was a true and good spiritual leader. The, the spiritual body of Osiris would be called the Jedi in the same sense that the spiritual body of Jesus would be called Christians. You know, that's in like a, a mainstream kind of way of looking at it. But regardless, the Jed pillar is a symbol. It looks like a, a column with round, it's kind of hard to describe, but it's actually based on a vertebrae, like a backbone. So the, the Jed pillar is a symbolic representation of Osiris' backbone, but it's a symbol that the... the kings of Egypt used to do at really important moments in time, like when it was passing from one king to another or when they really needed to make an effort to reconnect their whole culture with the cosmos and go to the next level of harmony and stability, they would conduct the raising of the Jed ceremony with their most powerful ceremony, their most powerful symbol. Mary attempts had told me about this, and, and listen, and I go, well, the Egyptian New Year is coming up here, which is July 23rd. Let's build a jet pillar. And we did. And I used PVC pipe and some wooden spools from telephone cable and electrical insulator that was laying around, and I built this thing and raised it on the Egyptian New Year. The Egyptian New Year is July 23rd because that's the day that the star Sirius becomes visible again in Egypt after being in conjunction with the sun for 70 days. And that represents the rebirth of Isis, who was Osiris' partner and sister. We raised the Jed on the Egyptian New Year, and then later that day, we went out to the beach and saw dolphins there for the first time at, uh, at Arnie's property. So the Mother Earth Temple, an outgrowth of all that, we put so much work into it. It's got several dozen painted rocks with the symbols of the chakras on top of the kiva is a, uh, a, a circle of 28 stones that represent all the different phases of the lunar cycle. And in the center of the 
root chakra medicine wheel is our regenerating eucalyptus tree. So I probably said more than enough, but... Oh, these pictures are, are absolutely gorgeous, and you couldn't explain it enough as far as I'm concerned. You know, for our listeners, I strongly recommend you to look at this. Well, we worked on it for four months. Wow. We brought it online with the activation ceremony right before we left. So it's actually operating now. It doesn't have to have anybody there to be online. It's, it's like a, a spiritual transmitter, bringing down energies from the cosmos and from the heart of the earth and beaming it out to anybody who tunes into it. We also felt that it, because like we called it an interdimensional park, that it's not even, doesn't really matter if any, any people go there because the spirits and ancestors and the lo local nature divas and the, the spirits of the land and the, of the Aboriginal people there, and they can all go and hang out there. They're maybe there right now. It's, it's truly amazing. I bet the energy there is just phenomenal. The single biggest thing about that environment is there's no electricity. I mean, there's very tiny amounts from some very weak 12 volt DC current being generated by some really old solar panels, but it's it's just about as free of electricity as you can get. And after you're there, like, Elizabeth's especially sensitive to the electrical fields and Wi-Fi and stuff. When she was, after we'd been there a couple of days, you could just, her whole body just started relaxing because she was able to release from the tension created by being around these fields. And most people, you just sort of, this tension becomes a part of their nature and you're all just kind of permanently stressed out. If you ever get away, be out in nature for at least a couple of days for this to happen. But the longer you're there under this kind of, situation, the more you realize that that's really how we're meant to live. We aren't meant to be around these alternating current electrical fields all the time. So we, we try to spend as much time as we can out in nature, and then you come back in and sit at a computer many hours a day for as long as you can stand it. Then you go back in nature again. The Hopi prophecy has an expression called, uh, the people of one heart will all somehow find each other and get in touch, and they're the ones that will eventually make it through all the, the weird day of purification things that are happening and, and all this stuff. That, so that's, that's been prophesied long ago that there are the people of one heart and, and they may be in, in any country, but they're all operating on a similar frequency. So while we're speaking of the people of the heart, can we now please go back to Barry Brailsford? I understand that you're going up there this week sometime to connect yeah, the week week. Thursday or Friday. For anybody that looks at Facebook, he has a really cool... Facebook page just called Barry Brailsford. We're going to be helping him and Coach Lyle create some blogs and maybe make a little YouTube video and stuff like that. But he has a wealth of material. Very, very fantastic people. And I just put a few uh, Castle Hill photos on his page yesterday. I highly recommend that, that people w order some of his books and familiarize themselves with, with his, uh, his story because it's really... It's focused on the ancient culture of, of the South Island of New Zealand, but it's really global. It's a global message that encompasses all traditional and indigenous people with sort of a, a universal kind of spiritual thing. He's not one of these new age guru people that goes around charging a thousand dollars for people to do a workshop with him or hawking all his uh, DVDs and stuff like that. They're, he's not on that kind of wavelength at all. So I would not use the word new age in conjunction with Barry Brailsford by any means. From there, there's a, a sacred area there, isn't there? It's Castle Hill. Do you want to tell us about your experiences up there, Jeff, and what this means to the Waitaha? Uh, again, Barry's the real authority on this, but as I understand it, Castle Hill, which is it's a, an outcropping of limestone boulders about halfway between Christchurch and Arthur's Pass, Barry just visually it's an amazing place because the, it looks like a city of rocks, or it looks like a, a city of people made of rock. You can go up and you could spend literally days or weeks just exploring all the little nooks and crannies and little caves and little regions. And it's a very friendly, peaceful area. And I'm not going to say this because I don't want to get it wrong, but Barry could tell you. I don't, I don't know exactly the kind of things that always happened there. But I do know that it was a very powerful sacred area. So I've been there, I don't know, one or two dozen times over the years I've been in New Zealand. And uh, every time it's different, but it's a very beautiful place, a very tranquil place, and you can really feel the energy of the rocks. This is even if you didn't really know anything about the White Tower or, or Barry Brailsford, but he's told us about what some of the different really big rocks have names and have special spiritual significance, and we've learned a little bit about that. So every time we go, it's very, you just feel charged up on energy. We went there once when we were here in New Zealand last year. We went to 
Castle Hill and, and went in and meditated and communicated with the giant grandmother rock. She's like the biggest rock up on top of actually what you call Castle Hill itself, which is the highest ridge there. And we left there and we drove the back way to Kaipur and saw this meteorological phenomenon called a Northwestern Arch, which looks like a big arch of cloud going across the sky. But it sort of intensified and it looked a little like kind of tornado conditions or something, but we were passing through this little teeny town called Swananella, which I recognized because there's actually a, a town in western North Carolina called Swananella. It's a Cherokee Indian name. So anyway, there's some kind of connection with the Cherokee Indians that saw a double rainbow forming, and so we stopped to get out of the car. For the next 45 minutes, we saw one of the most amazing full sky light shows of clouds just being lit up by the sun and all. I mean, there's no way to describe it visually, but we really felt that this was a gift that the, the grandmother rock at Castle Hill had sent to us on our after we came and paid our respects to her because I think it was the last time we were there before we went to the North Island. But it's a magic place. If you go there expecting something magic to happen, it will. Well, you know, you're heading up there in a few days. It's so special on its own, and I think we touched on it, but many of our members, many of the people that I'm so blessed to be surrounded by have started this journey with the Waitaha. It was brought to me by a dear friend, Craigo. A friend of mine has a uh, Māori healing centre here, Samant, and she lent me the book, The Song of the Stone, and it touched me like nothing I have ever read before. I couldn't put this book down by the time I had finished it. I had had every emotion possible. And I finally understood my journey here. All these people that have crossed our path since have in one way or another been connected to the Wataha or have an incredible yearning to learn about them. And I believe it is the time for this. And Dave uh, is a European who was given the task of writing some books for the Waitaha people. And, uh, it's a shared it knowledge that had never been uh, shared with the, with the white man before. Indeed. And he, like you, Jeff, gives rocks that have special meaning to people. And when, you, when I saw what you were doing with rocks, in fact, I even understand that you took, took some rocks back from New Zealand back to Australia with you because, of course, you paint them and you give them, you give your art to people. That's that was the first time I went to Australia. The head customs dude, like the, the chick was, was going to give me some shit about bringing a box of rocks into Australia, but the head customs dude, was like, <laughs> and he goes like, let him in, he's increasing the mass of Australia. <laughs> but no, but uh, Waitaha actually means water carrier. And it all has to do with the fact that we're all stoned. We're stoned. We're made of stone. Explain that, Jeff, because I've, I've heard you explain that before, but I thought it was pretty fascinating. Well, yeah, this, and this, it was explained by Barry Brailsford, uh, and, and it, but it, logically, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. If you think about it, the rock, uh, Earth, the Earth as a planet is basically made of rock. That's the main substance, and there's got, you know, there's petroleum down in there and there's water and there's air but the, the main majority of the mass of the earth is stone and so if you go back in the day there was probably more stone and less of all the other stuff so the soil I don't know about the origin of, of water and I believe that the atmosphere was basically created by the expulsion of volcanic gases and then it's been modified by living things to change the composition but basically stone is what the earth is made of so therefore, every being that lives here, life may not have originated on the earth, but it doesn't matter because everything that's alive that's on the earth, if you grew up here, then everything that you're made out of is the earth. Every substance, every mineral, every element life forms consist of is the earth itself. And so Barry actually said that stone, which is actually the earth, Stone contains within it the blueprint of life. And this would be sort of a metaphysical concept, but I really think that that's true. So therefore, every living thing, including us, all the matter that we're made of used to be rock. I'm going to go to a music break shortly. Jeff, I have posted your incredible blogs into chat there. Uh, folks, you, I, really re I highly recommend finding some time to check some of this work out. I feel very, very honoured to have you here, Jeff. I'm certainly looking forward to meeting you and your partner. Absolutely. We want to thank um, you for, for 
your interest and for having us. It's an honor, and thank you to us. Very, very excited about working with you. We would, we would love to do that. We have no shortage of really important, relevant topics to, to engage in media blather about. Be happy to blab all you want. Oh, no. Blab away. I mean, we're at, we're, in, we're at a pivotal point here, folks. We need to stay 100% in the heart. Reach out to your neighbors. Jeff and Lisbeth's journey is to show you if you are blessed to, to be touched by them, it is to show you that you don't need money to live. You don't need, if people would just share and give and love, then then all this would be over. And it's going to be well, over. If you want to fly somewhere, you can't, you can't take a wheelbarrow of painted rocks to the airport to get your ticket. Well, that, that is true. But isn't it incredible that when you live in the heart, amazing things happen? It is. And we, it, it's all, I mean, the whole concept of money is it only works on people. So ultimately, it's just psychology because if, if you had a billion dollars in cash or even gold, but that if there was no other people, it's absolutely useless. You can't do anything with it except give it to other people and then they'll do something for you. So we always go, well, why don't you just try to make friends with people who can help each other and then you don't need gold or money. I mean, it's, it's something that could work if enough people actually started thinking that way. You know, our marine life is constantly talking to us. There's a war on them. The war's been going on with them for such a long time now. It's time to step up, folks. It's time to just say enough computers. Get out there and actually act. Do something. Go plant a garden. Do all these things. Well, I just I wanted to say that it's important to be aware of these organizations and what the evil people are doing and stuff like that. But ultimately, I think if we pull back and realize that, that really it's all of us together are the human species and we're the ones doing this, if we analyze how each of us, and through things that we do on a daily basis without even thinking about it, everybody at different levels, but there's a few basic things that look at how, how much of the people do, that that actually makes us the equivalent of soldiers in World War III ourselves. So every time we get in a car and drive, that's almost, the, from the perspective of nature, that's the same as getting in a tank and attacking something, like driving a car, burning up the, the hydrocarbon fuel, talking on a mobile phone, eating meat, uh, building a house that's really stupid that you don't need, watching television, ingesting poison that someone else created and you pay for it. All the, these are things that, we're, that are damaging to the earth and to our own health. These are the things that you have a choice. You can say that you don't want to do these things and then you can stop or or at least cut back on it. But think of if a million people quit driving for one day, how much of a, it would lessen the burden on the earth. And plus you can starve the corporations out of existence by refusing to, to buy their products very much anymore. But from the second that we get up, we get up, we eat breakfast, we eat a corporation, we go and brush our teeth with a corporation, we uh, put, get, lather our bodies in corporation poisons and chemicals and leave that on our bodies. We go outside, we jump in our corporation car, we drive to a gas station and we fill it up with the corporation's petroleum where you pull out your corporation Blackberry and make a call. It, it is just a constant and yes, it's, it could be difficult for many, many folk to get these corporations out of their systems and quite literally, but by God, the health improvements that we would have overnight just with that. Just pull back on our use of it all. You don't have to stop it all, but just cut, cut way back to what you need. Rather than so many people are living at a level of just excess of all the stuff. I mean, I remember reading a, an article in Colorado and at, at 1990 levels of driving, Americans were supposed to drive one light year between 1990 and 1996. I mean, that was 20 years ago. So imagine what, what driving, the amount of driving is measured in light years now. You know, Jeff, when the Gulf oil spill happened, I stopped driving right then, right then. And people think I'm absolutely mad, but I can achieve most of what I need in my little town and we're in complete isolation here and it's, it's t taken some huge changes but we did it and I'm so proud I'm so proud yes I will be driving to Christchurch this week we are, you know, there is a time and a place, but uh, certainly taking, just getting rid of the $50 a week that's poured into those bloody petroleum companies that are ruining us. Oil is the, the blood of the earth. This is a, another topic that we could go to sometime, but the, the Hopi prophecy, they said uh, if we dig precious things from the land, we will invite disaster. And if, if you look at the root of a lot of problems, 
probably has a function in the Earth that we don't know about. Yeah, I was thinking maybe we can do that as a topic for one of our shows that we do together. Uh, I would really love to give people examples of how they can peacefully non-comply with the system. And the more people that do that, the faster the system is going to go down, the very system that enslaves us all. It's, it's empowering and it, it frees people up, helps your health get better, and costs less money, too. Absolutely. People are so used to and so trained all their lives to think that they need all these things that sometimes they need a little bit of a push and they need some examples on how they can can move themselves away from it. So I think that would be a great topic maybe for our, our next show that we do together.